Hello. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I apologize. Sorry, we want to get started, so make sure we have time. So I recognize last day of the conference, 9 a.m. Some of you may have had some late nights. Even more important that you're here. So thank you. It means a lot to us. So to start out with your, in case you didn't know what room you walked into, this is the climate change and health. Um, it, and we're going to be focused on emergency medicine research. So that's what we're going to really try to dive into over the next 50 minutes. So real quick, I'm going to introduce myself and then have my colleagues um, introduce themselves as well. So I'm Renee Salas. I'm an emergency medicine physician at MGH. And I also have a position at the Harvard Global Health Institute uh, to help advance the climate change and health research agenda. Next, I'm going to hand it to my colleague, Jeremy Hess. Uh, Jeremy Hess, I'm an emergency physician at uh, Harborview Medical Center and University of Washington in Seattle, and also work in the School of Public Health there. I'm Cecilia Sorensen. I'm an emergency, emergency physician at the University of Colorado, and I'm a uh, climate change and health science policy fellow there. Jonathan ran to support our residents who are apparently in Sano games without a coach, unclear. So Jonathan Sletzman, he's with me at MGH. He will be here shortly. He's an environmental engineer who's very interested in life cycle analysis and its applicability to healthcare sustainability. None of us have any financial interest to disclose. So we're going to try to answer two questions during our time here today. So one, why is research on climate change and health important? This is the first time this topic has ever been discussed in this forum. So we want to try to convince you that your time is well spent. And then for those of you who want to take the next step and actually engage in this research, how do you do that? So our structure, I'm going to give a very brief introduction. Uh, Jeremy is going to cover a, a core foundation uh, in this topic. Then we're going to have really brief presentations, about three minutes each, um, about what our research uh, topics are to give you some idea of the breadth of research which can be done. Because to be honest, we all sort of focus on different ways and are attacking this problem in different formats. We're going to then have a moderated panel discussion, which I hope can be fostered and facilitated by a lot of questions that you may have garnered uh, over the course of this presentation. And then we'll just wrap it up with a few conclusions. So I have a love-hate relationship with social media, but one, this is a topic which is not normally nor previously covered at SAM. So as much as you, if you want to promote it on social media, we would encourage that, obviously not required. So just to start out, so this is a very broad diagram about how climate change affects emergency medicine. There are a lot of circles on there, right? A lot of words. But part of that is just to show that if you, I mean, we could probably in this room in like half an hour come up with five research questions for each one of those circles. So there's a lot of questions that really need to be try, attacked around this issue. So just to kind of give the overall, and Jeremy will dive into this more, but I just want to give you kind of a tree-level view. So there are a lot of different climate drivers around climate change. We have temperature, increased carbon dioxide, extremes of temperature, um, sorry, extremes of precipitation, extreme weather. And then all of those are causing different exposure pathways, which are impacting health. For example, increased CO2 causes increased allergen production, which is going to then kind of translate when we look to health outcomes, that's going to increase exacerbations of underlying respiratory conditions. So as you can see, there's a lot going on, but all of this too is mediated through social and behavioral characteristics, in addition to different environmental and institutional characteristics. And we would argue that this is going to result in increased utilization of our emergency department services. It's also going to probably then subsequently result in increased cost. And so we have a lot of evidence is emerging on that. But again, more research needs to be done to truly answer all these questions. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy to dive into the core format. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Good morning, Jeremy. Thank you. That's Jonathan. Hi. Welcome, Jonathan. So I'm going to give you a bit of a whirlwind tour. Uh, I'm going to start to you or start talking about um, climate change and what it what it is, because we have to think about exposures. Before I get to that, though, I, I have uh, made a resolution to start talking about the impact of uh, the presentations that I give. Uh, as academics, we're all. Uh, required to build a reputation and that means traveling and they travel and the hotel stays and all of that stuff in addition to being expensive also is uh, a substantial uh, <coughs> commitment of carbon so 
my trip today, or this week, was uh, emitted about one metric ton of carbon dioxide. That's roughly 6% of the average American annual emissions. And according to uh, William Nordhaus, his most recent analysis, that's about $31 in social cost. Um, and we can talk a little bit about offsets, if you'd like, and whether they're valid. I have not offset this trip as yet. But I am at least acknowledging uh, its impacts. So I'm going to talk with you about climate change and health, and I'm going to give you uh, a very quick overview of uh, the relationships. And then I'm going to talk some about climate and health research, particularly through an EM lens. Um, and then we'll move on to some next steps, talking about others' research and your questions. <coughs> Climate change and health. So what is climate change? Climate change essentially is the retention of increased solar energy in our atmosphere. And that's the mechanism uh, that leads to increased CO2. Well, there are increased CO2 levels in the atmosphere that leads to that increased retention. It also leads to some changes in the ocean's chemistry. What we're seeing principally is warming. This is a temperature record that if you could map back uh, roughly 800,000 years, it's roughly consistent. We're starting to warm pretty dramatically. That's consistent with or coincident with increases in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, principally carbon dioxide, but not only. And that's related principally to combustion of fossil fuels and then changes in land use since the Industrial Revolution. And one of the things that's happening to the oceans is that they are rising, and that's because water expands when it warms and also because we're starting to melt land-based sea and ice. And you can see it already. This is a, a probability distribution function of temperatures back in 1950 and 1980. This is the United States. This is NASA data. And you can see a nice normal curve here, normal with the mean right in the middle. And as we move forward, this is, was a baseline of 30 years, which is technically what climate is. And then moving forward, just this decade, 1983 to 93, you see a shift. And the mean is no longer normal, right? Normal is no longer normal. We're starting to see more extremely hot temperatures. Again, moving forward through 2004, you've actually got quite a bit of uh, measurements in the extremely hot range. And you're now seeing temperatures, several standard deviations outside of what we saw um, in the earlier part of the century. And then through 2015, the march continues. And it will continue. The other thing you may notice is that the variance of the curve is changing. And uh, it's flattening. So we're shifting to the right. We're flattening the curve. We're seeing more extremes of heat and far fewer extremes of cold. And by the end of the century, it's going to be a very warm place here in the United States and elsewhere. We're already seeing impacts. Uh, <coughs> this is a graph of large-scale disaster losses. And you get some sense these are earthquakes, and they're relatively constant from 90 to 2015. But meteorological events, like tropical storms, are increasing, as are hydrological events, so floods and mass population movements related to uh, floods and other hydrological events. And then climatological events. All, all of these are driven by climate change. All of them are increasing. Uh, and this is losses. It's not exposures. So this has something to do with where we're putting infrastructure as well as what kind of events are happening. But uh, you have some sense of trends already. And just in 2017, we had all of these billion dollar disasters in the United States. Not all of which I would argue were necessarily driven by climate change, but certainly some of them were. What can we expect going forward? Well, we're going to continue to see changes in the hydrologic cycle, the cycle that water moves through the atmosphere and the oceans and fresh water. And basically, by 2090, we'll see pretty substantial changes in precipitation, both at the poles and in the equator and then some other areas uh, where you have a lot more extreme precipitation and actually also a lot more drought. And that can be coincident in places like California, we're already seeing that, where you have some periods of really intense rainfall and punctuated by long periods of drought. The ocean chemistry is changing, wherein we're seeing more carbonic acid. It's a simple equation. It's just interaction between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the water. It acidifies. It's not 
a big problem for us going into the ocean, but it's a big problem for animals with shells because it dissolves calcium carbonate. And the real problem there is that it is likely to lead to pretty widespread collapse of ocean ecosystems and food webs. And we're just starting to see this. Uh, this is going to be globally distributed because of mixing in the ocean. And there's really not an easy uh, way to address it. Now, I don't know if I'll be able to... This is a video that gives you some sense of the temperature. It would give you some sense of the temperature distribution going forward. Ah, it worked. All right. Um, so this starts 2015. This is NASA data. It's a NASA projection. It will give you a sense of scale here. This is 25 degrees Fahrenheit change in average surface temperature. Okay. So as we move forward, mid-century, you see we see a lot of warming over the land surface of the planet, particularly in the North Pole. And we can talk some about why that is, if you'd like. Getting toward the end of the century, in the North Pole, we're seeing a change on average that buries the needle of roughly 25 degrees. So in our home state, which has, if you visited, you know Seattle is ringed by mountains on both sides uh, that have snow on them most of the year, if not all of the year, by mid to the second half of, middle of the second half of the century, we expect to be in a rain-dominated regime in our region. We won't have snow in our mountains during most of the year. Uh, it's a pretty dramatic change. And the risks associated with it are substantial. As we move up to five degrees Celsius, now changing to the other scale, the rest of the word of world observes, we have risks that emerge to unique and threatened systems. So we have ecosystems around the world that are functionally extinct currently. Uh, as you move up, your risk of really dramatic extreme weather events increases. The distribution of impacts becomes widespread and global. The aggregate impacts are substantial. And then the risk of large-scale singular events, so collapse of major ice sheets and other things, becomes more significant. And if you think I'm being catastrophic already, we could go down that path and, and really scare the bejesus out of you. Um, those things are relatively unlikely, as far as we understand. But uh, the risk does increase as you see more warming. So it's all related to total carbon emissions into the atmosphere. In the 2000s, we were about right here. We're about right here now. We're on a high emissions pathway. We're not doing much to change that. So when you look at projections of climate change, I encourage you, until the path changes, to look at the high emissions pathway, because that's what we're on. If you take a Bayesian approach to things in your life, which I imagine you do as an emergency physician, you should stick to that pathway. That's the way we're headed. Uh, <clears throat> and so what will we experience when? Well, so on this scale here is temperature, degrees Celsius, average surface temperature for the world. This is 1900. This is 2150. And at 2035, we are expected to cross the 2 degrees Celsius threshold. Uh, we're We've already crossed it in certain years, certain summers in the United States. We've actually already crossed this. But globally, we'll, we'll cross it roughly in 2035. 2060, we'll hit 3 degrees, global average surface warming. And by roughly 2085, we'll hit 4. And on and on. Uh, <clears throat> you may know, have heard some about you know, the, the importance of keeping us at 2 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's, I think, by most considered the upper threshold of what uh, is tolerable. We, a lot of people actually think 1.5 is probably what's really tolerable. Um, and we're, of course, butting up against that now. Uh, two degrees Celsius is going to be impossible to attain, given our current trajectory, probably, without geoengineering or dramatic new technologies in carbon capture and sequestration, carbon removal from the atmosphere. So how does this affect health? Because that's really what we're here to talk about. Um, this is a diagram you may have seen before. It gives you a sense of the environmental impacts. So we've got increasing CO2 levels, rising temperatures, more extreme weather, and rising sea levels. And then you've got a sense of all these different pathways. So, And really, climate change does have the potential to affect almost any pa health pathway you can articulate. Whether the impact will be substantial or whether it will be more marginal 
depends on the location and the health of the population you're talking about, et cetera. But you can see air pollution, vector-borne and zoonotic disease, uh, respiratory outcomes and cardiovascular outcomes, uh, <coughs> vector I'm sorry, uh, diarrheal disease, malnutrition and food quality and availability, uh, large-scale conflict and interpersonal violence, and of course, heat-related injury and other injuries and mental health impacts. There are pathways that have been clearly articulated across the spectrum. The challenge as we go forward, this is a bit of a complicated image, but I'll walk you through it. Um, the challenge is to manage the extra burden of disease that's going to come with these exposures. And here's where we are currently. This is a, a figure from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the last assessment report, and basically gives you a sense of, of all those different health impacts, undernutrition, vector-borne disease, occupational health, mental health and violence, et cetera. What is the burden currently and how much of it is managed? And the red areas, a bit counterintuitively, are areas that you could reduce through aggressive adaptation. And then the yellow is burden that you just kind of have to live with given our current ability to reduce disease burden through various interventions. And you can see the burdens are not dramatic right now, but most of them are manageable, meaning in places that have a lot of uh, resources, you don't see many of these diseases in substantial numbers. And if you go forward 2030 to 2040, you start to see some unmanageable burden emerge and some uh, in places without resources, substantial burden that could be managed but just isn't because there are no resources available. And by the end of the century, the unmanageable burden is quite substantial and the unmanaged total burden is really significant. So our challenge is to figure out ways to make that arrow bigger because our population is going to be affected by these things. So how how is climate change and health research different than other research that you may have done and you may be familiar with? Uh, it's quite different, actually, I would, I would argue. <laughs> and it's different because you've got different exposures. You've got this wide range of exposures, and you've also got complex exposures that it's not just the warming that we're worried about. It's the social interactions and other complex pathways. You've got different methods, and I learned this the hard way when I came into this field, that a lot of the statistics are quite complex and they require time series, uh, expertise, and other things that we don't get trained on in medical school, at least not yet, and I doubt we will for a while. Um, so you need to partner and uh, find people who are expert in these methodologies because it, it's difficult to become casually familiar with them and be able to execute them effectively. The timing of these uh, exposures is changing, right? So that's another issue. You're always talking about what, what time point are you talking about health impacts? So this is Indiana. This is projected temperatures, extreme temperatures in Indiana. And historically, it never really got above 100 degrees. I grew up here. I know that. That's true. Uh, but right now, we're creeping up over 100. And with a high emission scenario by late, later in the century, high temperatures will probably be in the 100 teens here. So that's a 10 degree difference, but for an, a sensitive population, that's a pretty substantial change in exposure. Uh, but the point I want to make there is that the exposure is changing. If you're looking right now, the burden may not be very large, but if you're thinking forward, then it could be. But on the other hand, it's very difficult to know exactly how well the population will be adapted going forward. So you're making a lot of assumptions. Counterfactuals, I mean, related to that is what, uh, what's the alternative here? Is the alternative a very low emission scenario? Is it a medium emission scenario, et cetera? So thinking about what the counterfactual is against which you're comparing becomes very complicated, and there's not settled science around that. The other piece of this is that it's unprecedented. There are a lot of things in the exposure outcome associations that we've never seen. If you are looking at uh, curve, you know, the, the confidence intervals around some of these estimates are extremely large because we've never seen events like what we saw just this last winter, where the Arctic, this is a degree Celsius scale here, this is 30. The Arctic was 30 degrees warmer than normal. 30 degrees Celsius warmer than normal. This was in the middle of the winter, there was no sun, 30 degrees. This never happened in the record we have available to us 
This was in February of this year. And Europe was bitterly cold. Parts of the US were really dramatically warmer than usual. And the Arctic was, had an unprecedented temperature. The other thing that's different is there is no funding for this work. You will see, you laugh, but <laughs> you cry. Um, <laughs> Uh, the main group that you would expect to be funding this, NIH and National Inve Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, uh, you can look up, down, and sideways through their strategic planning, and it's really not a priority. Uh, it is really not mentioned. People are commenting a lot on it, but they have not moved. And you don't see it here, uh, though some people have argued, you know, argued it's the biggest public health threat we face. There are different ways to approach this. You can actually go with the climate models and think about the exposures and then look at impacts. Or you can think about the vulnerability and the unmanaged disease burden. And I would argue this is actually probably the more appropriate way to go, but this is the way that most people go, and it's a little bit easier and more conceptually, uh, it makes a little more sense conceptually. But we have a lot of unmanaged disease burden, even in our high resource setting, obviously. And so thinking about how climate change is going to exacerbate that is the way to consider these issues. And uh, <clears throat> as I've mentioned to some of you before, medicine is just the failed, is, is basically the result of failed public health prevention efforts. Uh, we do tertiary prevention work, and uh, it's valuable, but there are a lot of, there's a lot more value in many cases in really robust prevention activity. This is a diagram of the 10 essential public health services, uh, of which Diagnosing and investigating and treating are part, but there are many other things. And you can see research is central to all of it. Tony McMichael, who's one of my heroes in this field, wrote a piece in 2001 outlining some of our challenges. And he said, we need to characterize exposure outcome associations using retrospective study. He said, we need to develop surveillance activities to detect current health impacts. And we need to develop projections of health impacts going forward using climate models. I argue we also, at this point, need to develop adaptation strategies because we've not been able to reduce the likelihood of dangerous climate change. And we've focused on this uh, through some work I did at CDC. We took those 10 essential services and thought through some of the impacts that we need to explore um, and activities that public health agencies and uh, the health sector generally including healthcare, need to focus on. We've thought through what might an evidence-based approach be to these questions. And I'm going to move through these quickly because the details are not important. Uh, I'm just trying to give you some sense of the range of uh, work that needs to be done. We, of course, take an evidence-based approach to our work. And there are a lot of evidence-based questions that we don't have answers to at this point. But that I would argue you who are interested in this topic should be thinking through. So who's going to be affected in your population? And what decisions are you going to have to guide through an evidence-based <coughs> framework? What evidence do you have currently to lend to that process? What evidence do you still need? And how do you put it together and communicate it, which is difficult? There are many different points of entry. I think the house of medicine, and particularly emergency medicine, uh, has many different ways where we can explore these issues from a place-based approach, a population-based approach, a disease pathway approach, a focal approach, whether you work in global health and disaster relief, complex humanitarian emergencies, toxicology, pre-hospital care, health administration, medical education, data science. You can find ways to engage regardless of what your motivation and what your perspective is. And there are a lot of important questions to think through. Um, they have to do with the people we serve. They have to do with how we provide care. They have to do with how we interact with the public health system. They have to do with training and education. How do we train the next generation to deal with these issues? And how do we work from an interdisciplinary standpoint to make sure that our colleagues in climate science and other areas understand this work? From an evidence-based standpoint, these cat you know, familiar categories in terms of evidence-based medicine, there's research on harms, research on diagnosis, research on prognosis, and research on therapy. And we've done a lot of work in climate and health on harms. And we're clear that it's probably not going to be good for most people. 
In some places, there will be health benefits. I certainly embrace that because we need to look on the bright side. In some, some locations, it will be good for the population. But in a lot of places, it won't. But there's a lot of work to be done in these other areas, in particular around therapy. How are we going to address these issues uh, individually and collectively? We've done some work on Ciguatera fish poisoning, looking at the potential for increased burden of disease. I would put this in the harms category. And what we found is that as storm activity and sea surface temperature increases, you see a lagged but significant impact on the incidence of ciguatera fish poisoning calls to American poison centers here in the United States. The lag is about 18 months, but it leads to a substantial uh, increase in CFP calls to poison centers. And going forward with a 3.5 degrees Celsius increase, we see a substantial increase in those calls in the United States, all things being equal. When we look at harms in other places, particularly places that are not very well protected, like India, where in 2010 they had a very hot year. At that point, a record, the record's since been broken, but a record temperature in Ahmedabad in Gujarat state of 46.8 degrees Celsius. And it's a very vulnerable population, 7 million people, 25% of the population lives in slums very low air conditioning prevalence. And we did an ecological study showing that during that year where max temperatures were higher than usual, baseline mortality was higher than usual. And then came this heat wave, big spike in temperature and very large spike in, temper in uh, mortality, which was roughly 40%. And that's about typical. When you look around the world, unprotected populations have an increase in a 40 to 60% in baseline mortality with an extreme heat event. Um, what can you do about it? Because India is getting warmer, warmer and warmer. This is, again, looking at the scale, this is 11 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. We're looking at, you know, four to five degrees Celsius average temperature increases. Well, we've looked, and this highlights some of the interdisciplinary needs in research, but uh, we did some research to identify, using harms approaches, identify thresholds at which temperature seems to affect health. Then we worked with colleagues in meteorology and climate science to do uh, some forecasting work and develop new forecasting products for India. And then we developed communication protocols to communicate risk and articulate what people need to do to protect themselves. And then we are looking at interventions. And again, this is, I argue, where the rubber hits the road, but also perhaps the diff most difficult area because there's very little funding to pursue this work. But this is where we need to develop our evidence. Because I could not tell you how much risk is reduced with each of these interventions. No one can, because there's really not good intervention-based study out there in the world. This is a very interdisciplinary area, and I would encourage you, if you're interested in it, to think about how you'll connect with people who can help you do good work uh, by helping you get a sense of what the exposures are, think through how to do the geospatial epidemiology, think through how to do complex systems modeling, because a lot of these impacts require that. and then think through how to approach knowledge translation, which is actually a familiar problem for us in other areas. Of course, it's been politicized here. There's very little funding. Uh, the prior work in environmental health has really focused on harms. We tend to focus on harms a lot. It's some of the easier work to do. But in medicine, our, our strength is really developing evidence around therapy and diagnosis and other things. And so I think we have comparative advantage there. It's a large, complex field. And it is tough to understand all of the dynamics, but also develop a focus that allows you to move forward. Um, finding the right collaborators is important. And data is hard to find. Find partners who have good access to data, or leverage your data access to get good partners. Those are some things to think through. Um, all of that said, it's a young field. It's certain to grow, unfortunately. And there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Uh, it's an excellent field for people like us who are generalists and like new challenges and like interacting with diverse sets of colleagues. And as I said, lots of points of entry, so choose your poison and move forward and let us know how we can help. Uh, I can take some questions now or not. I think we'll just move, move on to the next step. So thank you. Hi, everybody. 
As I hope Renee said, I'm Jonathan Slutzman. I am at the Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, and I am unique in this panel in that I am an environmental engineer in addition to an emergency physician. Uh, raise your hand if you've seen 15 PowerPoint slides this week. Yeah, yeah, I have no slides. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how I take a complementary but different approach than uh, the other folks that you're hearing from today. I agree 100% with everything that Jeremy just said in that we are beyond a primary prevention and at the very least into a secondary prevention or tertiary prevention model of climate change and environmental impacts. However, I am uh, much to the antithesis of my inner core, more optimistic that we can do something to at least mitigate the, the primary impact. So what I look at is how we in healthcare are the problem, or at least a part of the problem. The United States healthcare industry is about 18% of our total economy, and we generate about 10% of all greenhouse gases in the United States. Uh, that puts us at about 13th if we were our own country. Uh, we generate in healthcare more greenhouse gas emissions than, uh, let's see, if I remember right, the United Kingdom, I think Australia, plenty of other pretty significant countries. So we are part of the problem. What I look at is how can we reduce our environmental impact as healthcare providers, as physicians? How can we look at our hospitals, clinics, ambulance services, and whatever else to identify the areas where we are generating greater environmental pollutants and translate those numbers into meaningful data for policymakers, for executives, to make data-driven decisions. For example, we can look at a process from cradle to grave. I use life cycle assessment as my tool of choice, where I can look at something from resource acquisition, raw material extraction through manufacture, transport, use, reuse, reprocessing, and disposal, and say that we generate X tons of CO2 equivalents, we generate so many uh, tons of dioxin equivalents, and look at a variety of human health impact categories and ecological impact categories. Greenhouse gas climate change potential being one of those. Others we look at would be human health impacts from cancer, human health non-cancer effects, ecotoxicity, lake eutrophication, uh, acidification of the atmosphere, ozone depletion. By the way, it turns out somebody's making a whole lot of CFC 11 that was banned in 1987 and is now 25% higher than, it, than it's ever been bef since then. So nobody really knows who's making it, but it's an ongoing investigation, kind of interesting. Uh, so I look at all of those categories and say, well, each of those translate to a certain number of, say, asthma exacerbations or hospitalizations or primary care clinic visits, and that costs money. There's no funding, but if we can show that resilience and mitigation and greening our own practices saves money, then maybe we can convince people to do it. So I, I welcome anybody who's, who's interested in looking at it, instead of with the left hand from the environmental impacts on human health, looking at it with the right hand of the impacts of healthcare on the environment, which both contribute in the non-virtuous cycle of poor health leading to healthcare services, leading to environmental degradation, leading to worse health. Now I turn it over to Cece, who has slides. <laughs> A lot of them. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking today about disaster medicine and the role that emergency medicine can play in helping to understand and articulate the urgent need for um, systems-wide uh, preparation. So since the year 2000, uh, the frequency of climate-related disasters has increased by 46%, according to a recent Lancet report, which has caused over $300 billion in estimated damages in 2017 alone. Now, importantly, the estimation of these uh, economic impacts do not include impacts from uh, health care, including mortality, exacerbation of disease, and new illnesses. 
So therefore, I feel that linking, um, accurately linking health outcomes associated with climate-driven disasters is essential to motivate policymakers to tackle mitigation aspects of climate change, such as reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and to inform adaptation in the form of climate-resilient healthcare systems. So we all know, and uh, Jeremy just uh, told us, that um, due to rising sea surface temperatures and warming air, um, we are seeing increased severity and frequency of Atlantic storms. So in September of this past year, Hurricane Maria, which was classified as the 10th most intense Atlantic hurricane on record, made landfall in Puerto Rico. And the hurricane completely destroyed the island's power grid, the communication networks, and the majority of the island's 69 hospitals were without electricity or fuel for generators. This resulted in critical shortages of essential medications. Um, additionally, staff couldn't get to the hospital because the roads were closed, and many residents could not access appropriate medical care in a timely manner. So the official death toll was reported to be 64. And people uh, in Puerto Rico, including healthcare providers and more importantly, funeral home directors, knew that this was a gross underestimate. So our objective was to provide an accurate estimate um, of the direct and direct uh, and indirect mortality following the hurricane in order to better inform disaster, respo disaster response efforts as well as risk reduction and preparedness planning. So in collaboration with the Harvard Center for Health and Human Rights, we conducted a stratified random cluster survey of the island to quantify the likely impact of the hurricane on mortality by comparing mortality in the months before the hurricane to mortality in the months after the hurricane. And to do this, we uh, basically um, stratified the island based on uh, remoteness, uh, which we determined by distance to the nearest uh, healthcare facility. And then we randomly selected 100 barrios that were representative of the eight different strata of remoteness. We conducted door-to-door -door surveys. There were lots of dogs. It was a little scary, but some of them were really cute. Um, <laughs> and we surveyed 30 households in each barrio, totally over 3,000 surveys. And so we basically knock on the door and say, can we talk to you about the impact of Hurricane Maria? And we asked them the following. We said, what was the composition of your household before and after the hurricane so we could account for migration? We inquired as to deaths in the household or deaths in the community. And then we performed a verbal autopsy, which is a great role for physicians because you kind of were really good at piecing together, you know, kind of what happened and sort of determining what the, probably the ultimate cause of death was. Um, and then we asked about, were there any delays in medical care for the deceased? Did the, did the person who died have a lack of medications? Were you not able to get them to a hospital because the roads were closed or because you didn't have fuel for your car? And then we asked if they experienced any interruptions in critical uh, resources, including potable water, electricity, and uh, cell phone communication. So the intention is that research like this um, will clarify the true health impacts of climate-driven disasters. And this is the message um, we try to promote in order to build uh, stronger efforts among policy to address the threats, um, and including um, development of system-wide emergency preparedness plans using evidence-based guidance, further research to understand climate change risk and detailed assessments of regional vulnerabilities, capacity building and resilience among healthcare facilities targeted to address the known risks, and improvement of energy efficiency of hospital healthcare facilities and hospitals, which not only reduces operating costs during normal operations, but also improves resilience by helping to ensure continuity of operations when extreme weather events cut off external pow power or fuel sources. So um, just in summary, why should emergency medicine lead these efforts? I would say that we know disasters and we're pretty much the masters of disasters. We know vulnerability and we're the nation's safety net provider and we stand on the front lines of impact and we are the specialty most affected. So thank you for your attention and hand over to Renee. Thank you. Let me see, there it is. All right. Well, I must admit, no matter how many times I hear my colleagues present and even though I know what they're doing, I'm still always honored to be sitting on the same panel with them every time I hear the work they're doing. So. I'm just going to give you a really quick overview of kind of the work I'm doing. Again, the point of this is just to really show you the spectrum of climate change and health research that can be done. This is a large problem and needs multiple approaches. So for myself, at the Harvard Global Health Institute, we have a very large health services research infrastructure, so significant uh, Medicare database uh, infrastructure. So from that standpoint, we're going to take these very large data sets and try to ask some very high yield questions. And really, as we're trying to go through and think about what of those exposure pathways to address, we truly want to ask the questions that are going to have the largest impact. And I think I love how, you know, I think the theme through that's hopefully been shown thus far is that really we want this work to result in policy impact. And so we need change. So you have to think about what are these results actually going to translate to? 
Because we can produce a lot of research that ends up in journals, but if it doesn't actually end up in front of someone who can do something to either assist with mitigation or adaptation, then I think we failed at some point, especially in this critical initial phase. So <clears throat> with that said, I'd like to bring up my colleagues. Uh, please sit up here. <laughs> and I'm going to start us off with a question, and then I hope that we can kind of ask, uh, have you asked any remaining questions that you may have? And we, this discussion can obviously continue beyond this time. But <laughs> so what I'd love to ask is that, I mean, the four of us have truly decided to specialize in this very unique and emerging academic niche, right? But not everyone can do that. So my question to you is that if you are, if individuals within the room already have existing research infrastructures that they use, how can they try to incorporate climate change as a lens that can help direct their research goals in the future? So essentially just trying to, I think that's not great. Essentially just helping, for, uh, helping to translate this to the individuals in the room who may not want to change their career path. I think it all depends on, on what you're studying from my perspective. Uh, what I would say is that uh, there are some great answers that, that these two folks are going to give because I think that it's, it's a little bit easier to do what they're doing and, and tack it on to whatever, whatever research topic or disease entity you choose to study. From my perspective, what I would say is that you could consider whatever disease process or area within emergency medicine or medicine as a whole you're choosing to make your niche, we can discuss and you can consider beyond just what is my impact on the patient in front of me, what is my impact on the patients that I don't see? How is the care that I provide affecting the natural environment, the, the ecological environment, the social environment around me, either by resource consumption or redirection or something of that sort? Uh, there's a lot of modeling that can be done to, to try and answer that kind of a question. Uh, rather than just saying, oh, I'm going to study heart disease and heart disease has this kind of impact on my patients and these are the treatments that either work or don't work, I can say, well, here are two treatments that, that work maybe roughly equivalently. What other outside factors might I consider to choose one treatment over, over another? Uh, so might I consider, well, one of these drugs is manufactured in a very ecologically uh, harmful way and another drug is made in a, in a much more benign way. And I can, I can in, in the same way that I research and study and take care of patients holistically in the emergency department, we look at the whole body, not just the, the right index finger. We can look at not just the patient in front of me, but the community as a whole and what, how can I maximize the utility and the goodness there. I would say that no matter what you're studying, climate change is a, is a threat multiplier. So if you take any disease that you're looking at, any disease outcome, you can use climatologic lens, a climate lens to look at it and say, well, how could this be, how could the distribution of this disease be changing in 10 years and 20 years? And with your coming at it from this, the point of like systems, for example, if you're in EMS or if you're in administration and you're looking at patient flows or you're looking at, you know, pre-hospital usage, climate is going to help make your predictions and make your impact stronger because you're taking relevant environmental factors into consideration. So I would say that no matter where you are, no matter what you're studying, climate change likely will affect um, the outcome you're looking at and will, if you use that data, will potentially increase the impact you can have in the field that you're working. And I would just echo what my colleagues have said, but also harken back to that slide around points of entry. and. Uh, encourage people to think about ways to pursue this, but also encourage it. Uh, so if you're involved in residency education, then there are ways to, there are needs around how do we train people that we need, we need information about that out there. But you can also encourage your residents to take on projects looking at some of these impacts. Um, you can bring the topic to the table 
And that, at this point, may be the most important service that people particularly higher up in emergency medicine can provide. Because I think we're not thinking about it the way that we need to be thinking about it. If you want to be doing research specifically, I would encourage you to be thinking about what you care about, what you can do, where you are, and uh, who your colleagues are, what uh, kind of networks you can activate to do the research that you want to do. And get in touch with us and we'll help you do it. It's a call to action. We need more people to join us on this panel next year, meaning that you have focused on that as your primary research objective. That said, I want to turn it over to you. What questions do you guys have? You can just raise your hand and I'll hand you. Unfortunately, we have to still use the mic despite the small room because this is being recorded. So, uh, one, well, thank you all again for your information. Um, I think one point we made is that um, trying to target our research and work in a way that will be able to translate into some kind of effective action is important. Um, have you put any thought into how to both identify people either locally or nationally or in organizations that you'd like to try to convey information to, and then also how to sync sort of the time frame of academic research, which can also be often be in the scale of years, to actually meeting sort of needs for decision making on the ground. So I'll, I'll take first pass. Uh, so one, I think it's the importance of using large data sets. So I think from that standpoint, and this is actually my first sort of venture into large data set research, uh, but I mean some conversations we were having is that you can actually develop a lot, uh, answer a lot of questions in a very rapid amount of time. And so I think that hopefully if we can especially start um, targeting some healthcare cost assessments, because I think that will engage some aspects within the healthcare community who have not currently been engaged. Because I think no matter what the issue is, money talks. Um, and so if I can try to actually slide across to evidence-based dollar figure, I think hopefully that will at least raise an eyebrow and maybe ask people uh, or cause people to at least ask more questions or become engaged. So I think maybe just the initial, and to your point, I mean, I think we, we definitely, there's so many questions that need to be answered, but trying to answer the questions that uh, in a way that can kind of help turn the tide. And I think it's, there's critical importance to like the work that Cece did, where she's actually on, boots on the ground answering these questions. And I think that gets to a granular level that obviously far surpasses what we can sometimes answer within large data sets, but it also takes time. So. I would just add that um, I think that the, the unit of adaptation in terms of where changes could be see and should be seen in terms of making healthcare systems and more sustainable and reducing health impacts really happens on the level of, of a small community or a small city, which means that it's still pretty much a grassroots type of movement. So getting involved in your local communities and your hospitals and giving talks and talking to residents and talking to administrators actually goes a really long way. One of the things I do in Colorado is there's a really powerful advocacy group called the Citizens Climate Lobby. And they're already really well organized. Um, but they all like want a medical advisor. They want someone to come and say, you know, you know, these slides are accurate. You're, you're portraying the right health impacts. And so from the medical profession, we can lend that type of expertise in a pretty, it's a pretty light lift, honestly. It takes a couple hours, you know, every couple months um, to assist advocacy groups. And that helps with local adaptation. It strengthens kind of that, that unit of adaptation. So I would, I would recommend that, you know, I think it, it can seem very daunting, like, well, I'm not a climatologist, I'm a physician, what could I possibly, how could I possibly do this? I don't, I don't know enough. And I think that's a big barrier for us as physicians is that we think we're not experts. And honestly, we will never be, and you don't have to be. Um, but you can get a basic understanding that will allow you to, um, to actually make a lot of impact. Uh, in our specialty, I think we need to reach the specialty organizations, the, the professional societies. Uh, we need position statements from ASEP and SAEM along the lines of what we've seen from many other medical specialties uh, domestically and other places, that this is a problem that we need to be paying attention to. It. So that's one group we need to reach. Um, I think we need to keep letting federal funders know that this is a priority for us. And uh, this is a challenge in emergency medicine generally that we don't have funding a funding stream that's really tailored to how we approach research in emergency medicine, and it's an extreme problem in climate and health work. And I take every t opportunity I can to let them know that what they're, the way they do things doesn't work for us and our patients. 
Um, one other thing I would, uh, to speak to the second part of your question, there actually is some uh, research funding available for disasters, both domestically and globally. There are funding streams to, for those of you interested in disasters, you can kind of pre-apply and get your IRB materials in order and, and have everything set up so that when a disaster hits, you then get a transfer of funds that allows you to do disaster response work and research. And um, I would encourage people to take advantage of that if that's what you're interested in because it uh, is one way to study some of these health impacts, some of which will be disastrous. A lot of them are going to be more s slow moving disasters. But. I, the advocacy side is, is absolutely imperative. Uh, our research, I, I almost laughed when, when CC was talking about, uh, um, about really wanting to make a larger impact and that, and that it means nothing if we just publish things. It, it means nothing unless you want to get promoted at work. <laughs> but the reality is we, we don't do this because we want to get promoted. If we did, we would be doing something more productive, I think, or more, uh, more well-funded. Um, we do it because we want to have an impact. So there are some organizations with which you can get involved. CC mentioned Citizens Climate Lobby. It's not just in Colorado, it's around the United States. There are chapters all over. So you can certainly seek out your local chapter. Um, you can lobby within your own healthcare institution to join an organization called Practice Green Health. It's, uh, it's a membership-based organization for healthcare institutions. So as an individual, you cannot join at least not easily that I know about, but your hospital can. And then once your hospital joins, you become a member and have access to all of their resources. Uh, then their partner organization is called Healthcare Without Harm, uh, and they are a little bit more of an advocacy kind of organization with a whole lot of individuals. As physicians, you can join the Healthcare Without Harm Physician Network. Their website is noharm.org. I think. Um, just search for healthcare without harm. Uh, and, and they have resources as well, can put you in touch with other people. Um, I think that we, we talk a lot about advocacy on the government level, either local or state being likely more fruitful than federal. Uh, but there's also advocacy within your own institution. You can be the uh, sustainability, climate change, environmental impact leader within your own institution, certainly within your department, if not your institution as a whole, just because there are so few of us who are working in this sphere. And advocating to get your institution to be on that leading edge, uh, you can do it through, through kind of plying their concept of competition. You can say to them, well, you know, Kaiser is doing it. Why can't we? Um, to, to really get your institution out there to get, to get more on the leading edge to do better, to win awards, which then might translate from their perspective. Again, this is all about their reputation and way to get revenue. It's, hey, if we are an award-winning institution, maybe we get more patients. Patients equal revenue. So talk the language that they're interested in. Awesome. Well, we can continue this conversation. Uh, at the interest group meeting, which I hope all of you will go to. It's actually just a couple doors down. I didn't even plan it that well, but at least we don't have to walk far. But I know there is a session in here at 10. So just to kind of summarize, I mean, overall, I hope that you understand what the implications are for climate change and health research on our specialty of emergency medicine, as well as the broader picture. I hope you under, kind of walk away with the fact that it really requires an interdisciplinary approach and collaboration. Uh, because again, as CC said, we can't be experts in everything, which is why, and we're stronger together, so you need to get a team. There are definitely some barriers, but hopefully we provided some idea of solutions and funding sources, while scarce, um, are available, and hopefully we'll be growing. And really, you know, tried to give for those of you who may not want to change your complete research objective, although I hope some of you will decide to engage in this primarily, also get some idea about how to start engaging climate change as a lens into your existing research infrastructure. And then again, this is a wide open field, so as far as thinking, there's a lot of questions that can be answered, which is good if for someone who's looking to engage uh, in a new research track, you can easily kind of rise as an expert to your field. And again, another plug, join us up here uh, for a future panel. 
So with that, uh, again, uh, the interest group is going to be down in 308. We're going to have that, and it's the inaugural uh, interest group meeting. So thank you so much for your time, and please don't hesitate to come up and ask us any questions. Thank you.